Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Season 1 of the TV version of Building the Future is now streaming online at buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have part 2 with Mike Lingle. If you missed part 1, you can go to buildingthefutureshow.com and uh, listen to it there. Mike, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be back. Yeah, I'm excited to have you back on the show. We kind of ran out of time um, last time when we were recording and you've had quite the career in this where you've worked for huge companies, you've had huge companies as clients, you sold a company, you, you've kind of been through it and you have tons of really good advice and you've been posting some really good articles um, through your newsletter and whatnot and I was hoping that, you know, last episode we could get into some of this stuff but we didn't so I thought let's have you on again to get to kind of cover some of those topics because I think they're really good and there are even some things that like I've struggled with or still struggle with, right? And I think there's a lot of people out there that struggle with the exact same things. Yeah, uh, and I definitely have some of the same conversations over and over again, and I think that's part of what I'm trying to get to with the stuff I've been posting. Sure, sure. Um, you know, it's helpful for other people, so maybe they can uh, learn from my mistakes. And then I think it's also helpful for me because it helps me kind of think through the best way to position it for when I talk to the next person. So maybe I can help them a little bit. Sure. Uh, more no, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and you do like mentoring and a bunch of stuff and teaching and stuff like that, right? And you work with other yeah. startups. So I'm sure you, you probably get this question asked a lot. So um, I, I guess maybe before we kind of get into your articles and some advice, like what – was the real deciding factor that you really wanted to start kind of blogging? Was it, I, I get that, yeah, obviously to kind of get it out of your head and onto paper because you get asked all the time, but it's got to be kind of to help kind of publish and put out good content, correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, and it's sort of a, it's sort of a positive, virtuous okay. cycle. Um, and there's really there's really a few different components to it. You know, it, it all stems from doing my own, you know, having run my own business and continuing to run my own business because this consulting sure. is essentially a business. Uh, talking, so I run into challenges just doing that, the same challenges that everyone else runs into. Talking to entrepreneurs, I spend most of my day in conversations with them, either just, you know, uh, looking at pitch decks or offering you know, sometimes people just ask me for advice. Sometimes it's in a consulting format. Uh, I've been teaching, uh, which is similar to consulting, but a little bit different. Um, you know, working with an accelerator here in nice. Miami called Venture High. Uh, and that's been terrific. Um, and the nice thing about the mentoring versus the consulting is I can, I get a window into more startups at sure. once. And I really, I really like that ability to expand my view uh, and I like being able to help more no, people. No, that's awesome. Uh, and then the, it, it's been great. It's been a nice sort of um, extension of what I've been doing. And I find the writing does a couple things. One, it helps me reach sure. even more people, um, you know, even broader than who I can talk to in person. Uh, two, it really helps me think things through, again, so that um, – when I'm in, the, in a conversation with the next person, I really have, I really understand, you know, I've, I've taken the time to sort of think it through and figure out how sure. it, how it works. Uh, so it's easier for me to explain, you know, and then yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get my name out there and that's sure. definitely part of it as well. Uh, and those are kind of the pieces. And I, I guess what I've found from especially the, teaching and the consulting, you know, I spent years running my own startup and a lot of that I was doing what everyone else does. I had some experience, but I was making up a lot of it as I went along and I had advisors I would turn sure. to when I had questions. And, you know, in the past, in the past uh, year when I've started teaching, 
I find uh, that there's gaps in my knowledge or stuff that I did that worked, but I don't necessarily know that it's the right thing to do. I just sure. made it work for me. So, so I find what I do with the mentoring, uh, and it really started, you know, Adventure Hive is a curriculum. Um, they've built out a whole, a whole curriculum, and each week has a different theme. Uh, and they're actually look, they're actually starting to power some of their accelerators right. with the content, uh, but their curriculum is really good. So what I found when I was mentoring uh, was I was going through their curriculum in advance uh, of the class, and a lot of stuff I knew, a lot of stuff I'd done, but I was always I mean there's always sure. more to learn, right? Uh, and that you know I also read a couple oh, of wow. books a week. Um, most of them around business or wow. startups or whatever. So I'm just constantly integrating new material into what I, into what I, into what I know. And then I'm always sure. talking to startups. So the stuff I'm learning combines with my experience, and uh, you know, over time I just get better and better and better because I've got both the experience sure. and the theory. But I find I got to keep sharpening the sure the and, set, but I, but I also think that's really good advice in itself right because you've been through it you've sold a company and, and you're still hustling and trying to learn and you know, like you just said you you're still reading books on this stuff because you're constantly learning right and I think that's super important to stress again yeah uh, you know and I find uh, again there's always more to learn and there's always a better way to do things and there's always a way to optimize and there's always stuff that sure. I don't know. Um, yeah. And I find, I don't know, even a book a week, I have a backlog sure. of stuff I want to, I want to read. Um, and I think, you know, we've all, we've all sure. read the lean startup, right? Um, or at least mm -hmm. people have heard of it. Uh, and so I went back and read The Four Steps to the Epiphany, which came out. Um, it was written by a guy named Steve Blank, and it was it was written before The Lean Startup. And uh, Eric Reese, the guy who wrote The Lean Startup, was actually a student of Steve Blank's and built on his work to um, create The Lean Startup. And so the Steve Blank stuff is really great. Um, it's a little harder to, it's a little less actionable because okay. it's kind of complicated. But he makes some really interesting points. Um, one of which is that you know your your real competitive advantage as a small company is your ability to sure. make decisions quickly. So you need to build an organization that's taking in information and learning quickly, and then making decisions quickly. Um, and that's how you really beat sure. your competitors. Uh, and he makes the point that um, you know you can structure your company. And you want to structure your company different than a than a larger established organization, and that oftentimes if you hire big executives from big companies early, they can't actually operate um, in that environment particularly well because they're used to a different uh, sure. they're used to more structure and sure. slower decision making and more sure. resources. So then you have a lean startup that built on that. Um, and then recently I've been reading, uh, there's a guy named Ash Moria who wrote a book called Running Lean a few years ago, and he's got a new book that just came out a couple of weeks ago okay. called Scaling Lean. And he's building on both of those guys. Uh, and I'm finding his stuff to be a lot more, way more actionable even than the lean startup. Uh, and he's got some great shortcut tools. Uh, so there's a one-page document called a Lean Canvas um, that came from something called a business model canvas. Uh, but Ash Moria turned it into the Lean Canvas, which is basically a one-page document with uh, a few boxes in it, and you can map out your entire business model. And then you can discuss that business model with, um, with other people quickly you can iterate it quickly because it's just basically bullet points on a page. And it tells you, basically it tells you what hypotheses you need to go test. Who is your customer? What are their pain points? Will they, you know, will they uh, react well to your solution? Will they pay the price you're, acting, you're asking? These are all things that are guesses that sure. need to be verified. No. 
So that's a tool I wish I had when sure. I've been running my company, right? Um, I was able to, you know, run companies without that tool, but it's so much quicker and easier, and I'm really using that a lot more, both for my own business and in the and with the sure. businesses I'm working with. So there's, I just find there's stuff like that just lying around out there that um, that I want to bring in and incorporate and optimize so that I can be more effective with with the company that I talk to. And then that's information that I can just pass along so anyone else, I mean, Ash Mori is obviously passing it along as well because it's his thing, but I can pass it along to, to my circle and, and help them speed up uh, their ability to Yeah, to no, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think it's kind of interesting because I know – at least where I live right now, um, we're kind of in quite a bit of a recession. Um, where I live is a lot of kind of – it's a big government, oil and gas kind of um, town. And um, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of companies locally that are doing kind of service work, whether they're the agency type um, or they're maybe even just like a web shop. And they're looking to kind of get into doing their own startup or even just like – working with a client of theirs to turn maybe a project that they're working on or a product they're working on actually into a company on the other side where they partner with their client and kind of release it to that. And I think your your last couple articles kind of really resonated with me in that because, and I'm sure there's a lot of companies out there across the world that are, you know, maybe trading time for dollars and they're thinking like, how can I maybe build a product on the side or transition to eventually building that product full time and kind of maybe weaning off the client work a little bit or maybe still doing some but kind of having a product and I, I thought your your article like especially about kind of is your startup kind of learning to get paid kind of resonated with me when you know people were, were asking me and talking to me about that kind of stuff right and I think the thing that kind of resonated to me with uh, with it is how you you basically did that but and you did that with a huge company kind of helping you build a product or at least that's how i understood it correct right yeah they were they were basically paying for me to build to assemble a team to build what was at the time a custom product for them but then we made that same decision to to make the shift in our company, which is which is essentially a service business, a custom development shop, and just start going sure. after that product. And I don't know, do you get that question quite a bit? Because like we seem to be getting that question all the time. Yes. And it seems to almost be like a hot topic right now, especially when where I live, like I mentioned, is going through kind of a recession and trying to find clients all the time to pay the bills is tricky. But if you have this recurring revenue from a product that is, you know, obviously you have clients all over, you, you can be more recession proof. Right. And, and I'm actually going through this okay. with my business right now. Um, you know, I, I've spent part of this week putting together my own lean canvas. Uh, you know, I just got married. I'm doing a lot of soul searching about what is the career? What is the stable, sure. repeatable income? Uh, I've been crazy busy with the consulting and the mentoring right. for the first half of the year. And uh, then I intentionally let things slow down sure. a little bit for the wedding. Um, and now I'm back and I have a moment to catch my breath and decide what I want to do. And I'm in that same situation. Like I make most of my money at the moment right. through service, um, which is hourly, hourly mentoring and consulting, sure. and which is great. But there's an upper limit on, um, A, how much sure. I want to charge startups because I work with early stage startups who don't have a lot of cash. And B, how much time I can spend. You know, at some point I'm just exhausted sure. every day. Uh, and I love the work, but it's like, you know, it's that same thing. So I've, I've spent a bunch of time this week trying to figure out, and, and I think the articles are the beginning of this, how do I move some of that online and essentially productize um, some of what I'm learning, which essentially requires building a product and finding customers for that product and, and you know, really understanding. I think there's a couple okay. things you want to do. Um, and the lean canvas is really good for this. So uh, you're essentially going to come okay. up with a bunch of hypotheses. These are my customers. So my customers are early stage startup okay. founders, right? Um, what are their sure. pain points? 
so their pain points might be, you know, they have some idea of what to do and they can read a bunch of books, um, but it would really help them if they had someone to talk to who's sure. been there before. Um, one of their one of their pain points might be that they want to grow, but they've never grown a okay. team before. So again, they might want some guidance on, you know, how do we hire? How do we do compensation? How do we set up sales? How do we grow the sales team? How do we think about that? What do we do for marketing? There's a bunch of questions that sometimes people haven't gone through and it helps to have um, regular conversations or strategy sessions with someone who's been there before. And then the third thing is really around focus and accountability. So, you know, as a founder, I'm on overload, right? There's a million emails I can answer. There's a million things I don't know. There's a million things I can read. There's a million people I can talk to. There's a million networking events I can go to. And if I'm not careful, days, weeks, and months disappear and I haven't moved the ball down the field closer to the Yeah, that's goal. interesting. I've been thinking a lot about that actually uh, recently because the like through the show sometimes I kind of get asked and I I almost like start telling people sometimes like stop reading and going to networking events about like how other people made it and just like <laughs> start figuring out how to make it for yourself. I'm not saying don't don't read ever again. I'm not saying don't go to networking events, but like to your point is you're getting, you can get so lost in like going to a networking event every night, trying to read like 12 books at a time and, or at least chapters in a bunch of books. And like you just said, you, you never actually build Mm -hmm. your product. Right. And as good as some of that knowledge can be, you really need to make time to build out your own kind of startup. Yes, exactly. Um, and I think there's something around the regular cadence of talking to someone who's built companies, who understands the theory, but every week, you know, you're setting goals and you're moving the ball down the field in recognition of you're going to have another conversation sure. the next week. So it's just easier to stay on focus, plus you're getting that, sure. that guidance. So those are kind sure. of the pain points, right? Um, based on my experience with, with founders. So my customers are early stage startup founders. Uh, the pain points um, I just went over. And then, uh, you know, the question is, um, sure. what are they using now? So, you know, what, what are the ways they're solving that problem? So they might join an accelerator, right? Which is maybe it's a 12-week program. Maybe they get some cash. Maybe the accelerator takes some equity. Uh, maybe they have a board of advisors. Um, So they might talk to someone once a month. They might be paying some equity for that. Uh, They might be reading. They might be doing online classes. uh, They might be doing newsletters. There's all kinds of different ways um, that people can, can start to solve this problem with different costs. So part of what the business model canvas does is, is I can start with those three things uh, and then get up out of my chair and go talk to people and see if that's gotcha. really true. You know, um, and I think this is where, you know, this is where founders are into trouble too. So there's sort of the accountability and focus piece. Um, but there's also, I think there's a tendency sometimes when I talk to people, people get a vision in their head and they want to build whatever it sure. is that that vision is. But you have to blend in what real people sure. care about and what they will pay for and how they will behave. And I think that's kind of a that's sort of a complicated and that can be a little bit tricky and it's a complicated interaction. But it starts with taking your hypotheses about the customer, the problem and the existing alternatives and going and Makes verifying sense. them. So right now, you know, I put together my business uh, my lean canvas on Monday. And then every day this week, I've been talking to at least one entrepreneur and verifying, uh, you know, what are they doing now? Are these real problems? How would they rank these problems? Are there other problems they're dealing with that I didn't put on this list? Um, And trying to get a sense for, you know, can I dial in the customer segment a little bit more? Um, And one of the things that's come up in the past week is it's not necessarily just early stage founders. It might be founders with a little bit of... um, of uh, 
external validation. So it might be founders who've been accepted to accelerators or incubators or out of that program and are looking gotcha. for continuing guidance. Um, it might be people in Miami who I can talk to. You know, I'm still kind of dialing that in. But, you know, over the next few weeks, I'll be verifying those. Yeah, and, and see, like, and no, I, I was going to say, like, yeah, I love the fact that you're still doing this, right? And even though you've been through it before, like, I think I think that's super important because people forget about kind of almost like doing their homework, right? Especially when they've been through this. Right. And a lot of times if you don't do your homework, you, you probably yeah. end up failing or you – or your chances are a lot higher of failing. Yeah, if you're not if you're not planning to go anywhere, you usually fair. don't go anywhere. Oh, fair. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds so simple, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But it's totally true, and I, I run into this a lot. But then the question is, how do you how do you set the how totally. do you set the goal? And I think traditionally we've used business plans, we've used pitch decks, we've used executive summaries, we've used spreadsheets and charts, and we've held it in our head. And what I like about the Lean Canvas is it's something that you, know, you can put together in an hour, and then you can immediately sure. go talk to people about it. You know, So I can review my business plan with people, or I can pick just the pieces that I want to talk about. With the potential right, customer. and then that kind of leads to if you can get your first customer as early as possible – then you know and even if you're not making tons of money off of it especially if you're if you're just starting up and you're still working full time or or you have kind of a part time at least or something right you can at least start validating your idea right. and then um kind of to your other your <laughs> other kind of article about how your your like is your startup kind of learning to get paid right i think your first and kind of third article really kind of work together nicely in that sense where once you figure out kind of how to learn and get paid, you need to kind of keep learning to still keep getting paid and recruit more customers, right? And right. it sounds crazy, but it, it's so kind of like a simple thought, If but if you don't think about it like that, and I think especially kind of outside the valley, you really need to think like that, right? And I think there's so many articles coming out of the valley, like you right. should be the next Instagram. It's like, Sure, everybody wants to be the next Instagram, but you can build a really good business in industries solving a real problem, making real money, if you kind of figure out early on like how to learn to get paid and then keep learning to keep getting paid. Right, and I think that's really what a business is, is it's a money-making enterprise that delivers tremendous value to customers such that they are willing to pay sure. you to solve their problems. That's what a business is. And the money raising is a distraction. You know, and I think that, I think that people see the money raising, they're like, oh, if I just raise this money, then it'll all take care of itself. But, but sure. that's not true. You know, you still, you still at the end of the day need to right. build the business. Um, and in some ways, it's actually easier to build a business without all the resources and the distraction of sure. raising the money. And I think, I think what I really like to see and, and what, I, you know, what I think makes the most sense is build a working business model. Um, and this is one of the things that Ash Moyer really pushes in running Lean and scaling Lean. What you're building is a working business model. You're not just building an app or a service sure. or a product. Um, and that working business model requires you to deliver value to customers, to receive value in return, and to make sure that the value you receive totally. is less than your costs. Uh, and, and if you can build that and show that people are really using this thing, then it makes sense to raise money and use that money as fuel to power the rocket ship using the engine right. that you've I, already I think built. That, that's interesting because you mentioned kind of the story of like Tony from Zappos in – in one of your articles, and I thought, I, it's been a long time since I've heard that kind of story, and I think that's basically what he did, is what you're just describing. Right, and he didn't even start Zappos. I was actually surprised at that, because it's not Tony. Oh, really? I had to go look it up after I came across that story. But it's some other guy whose name I can't even remember, because <laughs> Tony came in later. Uh, 
but it's some other guy who was going to the shoe stores and taking photos of shoes. And then when he sold them online, he would go back and buy the shoe full price from the shoe store. And, you know, he didn't build a complicated website. He didn't build logistics. He wasn't doing any of that stuff. Whereas I think, um, you know, I think a lot of founders, people starting startups are like, oh, I'll raise the money and build the logistics system and then I'll have this big company. And he basically started, it cost him basically nothing, right, to start that. Or to do that, right? right? And, and, and they what? They sold Amazon for what? A few billion dollars? I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head. Yeah, like a, I think it was like one, I think it was like 1.1 yes. 1. 1 billion or something. Yeah. I mean, you know, enough. <laughs> yeah. We, we always joke. <laughs> that, that guy's probably eating the blue box of Kraft Dinner, you know? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, and there's another book I've read um, that's, that's called The $100 okay. Startup. Uh, it's written, it's essentially, uh, it's the blogger who got excited about this topic and went out and interviewed 1,500, um, you know, small business founders uh, who were usually selling sure. stuff on the internet, um, but not necessarily. And they all started their businesses for less than 100 bucks, and they all have, you know, they're all supporting themselves right. with it. Um, it doesn't mean that they're selling Amazon to Amazon for a billion dollars. But they started from this concept of I'm going to have customers and they're going to pay me, sure. and then they grew from there. Um, and he really gets into the nitty gritty of like how did they do that? Okay, sure. No, <laughs> I I think that's awesome, right? I, yeah. I think there's a good list of resources, right? Yeah. I, I love the fact that you you're giving all these good resources that people can go can go check out. Yeah, because I certainly don't have all the answers. Um, you know, part of what I'm trying to do is just leave a trail that anyone can follow. Uh, and part of what I'm trying to do is take some of what I'm seeing, you know, both what I'm taking in from reading and from conversations with entrepreneurs and package that into these articles so that the most useful stuff is easily accessible. Sure. No, I, I, I love that. And that's partly why I wanted to do kind of a second episode with you because you're in there, you're talking to people, you're doing it yourself, you've been through it. So... You know, I, I, I love the fact that you are openly admit you still don't have all the answers. And you, in, in a lot of people's eyes, like, you're extremely successful. You've done this before. And you're still saying, like, look, I'm learning. I still don't know it all. Like, I love that, right? And I think a lot of people are scared to right. just do it because they figure they need to learn everything. And you will never learn everything. Like, it's just impossible. Yeah. So yeah, the, the other thing that, I, that I've obviously been thinking about lots is is kind of the equity stake side of things and um i it's interesting because i I get asked kind of all the time and i'm sure a lot of people do too um because like i I work as a creative director as my day job and so you know people always want me to like i got this app idea and you know i i'll give you i'll give you 50 percent and i'll keep 50 percent but you do all the work and then of course you get the people that you've worked with in the past that you legitimately say, you know what, that's actually not a bad idea. You know, you do maybe the marketing part and I'll do kind of the design and we'll get a developer and we'll build this thing, right, in the evenings and weekends. And it's interesting because we always kind of at the beginning, it's like some of these people I've known for more than a decade and we've done projects here and there. But when when that kind of, how do we split the equity of this project that is vaporware, you know, today, that could potentially maybe do something or make a little bit of money. I, I really liked how you kind of talk about slicing um, kind of the pie and the equity in, in a startup. And I think it really got me kind of thinking, um, so do you maybe want to kind of mention your thoughts on kind of equity? And, and I, I love the fact that you kind of have to work for your share over a period of time. Right. Um, and let me say one thing before that, just sure. to set the stage for that. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of playing off, um, and, and I talked a little bit a bit about this at the beginning of the Slice and Pie article, and you just mentioned it. But the perception and what happened when we, when we started um, Slide Rocket, which is an online yeah. presentation software, this perception that you know, whoever's building the software has to, has to build a bunch of stuff first 
while everyone else waits around. And that was certainly the situation we found ourselves in, and that led to some of the, you know, that led to some of the uh, negotiations sure. over the equity and the reallocation. Uh, what I've figured out um, with Lean Canvas and with the Running Lean book, um, you know, is and what I'm talking about with having your startup learning to get paid, if you're really going out and talking to customers based on the hypothesis, you can verify that there's a problem that people will solve. You can anchor the pricing based on what people are paying to solve that problem now. You can figure out, you know, validate your customer, validate your early adopters, and then you can go back and build a mock-up of your product and figure okay. out the pricing model. And so you still haven't, you still haven't developed anything. Uh, and there's a lot of work in going out and talking to people and validating the hypothesis. Now you've got a mock-up and a pricing model. You can go back to people. And this is kind of the magic of, of running lean. You go back to people and have conversations with them. You show them your mock-up, walk them through it, get their feedback. Then you show them your pricing and try to get them to agree to buy right, right there. Because um, you can't actually validate pricing verbally. The only thing that validates pricing is people sure. actually that's buying. A, that's a really good point. Because uh, people, <laughs> sure. people will tell you all kinds of things when you're sitting there with them. But they'll do very different things when it's time to pull out the checkbook sure. or, the, or the credit card. So, um, you know, what, what Ash... What Ash Moria's point is, and what I think is great, and you know what I've tried to do in my own in my own business, is go validate that pricing and the pain point sure. and get paid. Um, then, now you know exactly what you need to build as a minimum viable product, and you can do that. But there's work for the entire team to do, and you're not just waiting for the software guy right. to write a bunch of code. So you validated that you're building the right thing. And you're building as little as possible uh, that you can give to customers that really is going to provide that value that's going to make them pay. And you've got money right. coming in. Now, you may have to offer them a, a money-back guarantee because they're early customers. You know, whatever you need to do to make them feel safe. But you now have, uh, you know, the beginnings of a working business sure. model. Um, so that's... That's the magic of the lean startup, and there's work for everyone to do, or that's the magic of running lean, sorry, and there's work for everyone to do right, who's right. on the team, both in terms of development and in terms of, you know, you're essentially doing sales and marketing right from the beginning rather than waiting for a product, and you know your product is going to be much more um, useful to people. Because I think there's, you know, founders have a vision, right? Like that's why you start a company. You see a problem sure. and you see the solution. The problem is people don't behave the way you expect them to behave. Yeah, that's fair. So you know, you got to you got to set the vision and get something out there but get into conversations with people cuz cuz what you actually deliver is going to veer off from where your vision is if you want people to actually use it. And you're going to have to work with a, you're going to have to work with the customers to adjust your vision to to actual human behavior and actual you know what people right. will actually pay for. And so you want to get into those conversations as soon as possible before you've built anything, uh, and certainly before you've built anything complicated, because it gets harder and harder to change uh, change the direction of the ship once you're sure. under full sail. And, and I guess that makes a lot of sense, because then okay. you have everybody almost hitting the ground running, working towards their equity share almost from day one, Correct. Yes, and that takes us gotcha. back to the slice no, of no, pie. So I just I want to I just say there's work for everyone, and, and that's one of, and that's one of the things I didn't know. I didn't know yeah, there was work I, I for would everyone. Have, I wouldn't know that either. You know, and I, I think that's important. <laughs> uh, if you're doing it right, there's work sure. for everyone from day one. So, and and I think so. Here, here are the conversations I've had with entrepreneurs, and here's some okay. of the stuff I've done myself. Um, you know, what, what we did with one company was we had a verbal agreement but never signed anything. And guess what? Things changed and, you know, one person wasn't contributing, one person thought they were contributing more. And so, we, you know, a year and a half later, two years later, we were going through this agonizing process of figuring it out after we all already right. thought we had a verbal agreement. Sure, and I can it imagine. Uh, 
So that's bad <clears throat> because people really do contribute different amounts once you sure. get into the work phase. It's just the way things are. Uh, two is we, um, you know, I, I see people do vesting schedules and I think that's great. And I think you absolutely need to have some kind of vesting schedule because if it's not working, you need to be able to um, ease someone out without them taking a giant chunk of the company. Right. I think that's really good advice. Uh, and the vesting schedule and the vesting schedule does protect you from that. And sometimes people just don't know that. Uh, but you really do need okay. a vesting schedule. Um, and I've, I've had a ton of conversations with entrepreneurs who, and I've done this myself, who've given away a chunk of the company and then they're like, wait a minute, I want it right, back. Right. You know? Uh, right. Cause this person isn't performing or, I mean, not even because they're a terrible employee, but something may change. You know, they're, they may have an illness in the family or, sure. you know, whatever. Yep. Anything can happen. So, um, but that's a really, even that, the vesting schedule is a really blunt instrument because it's binary. You're either in the company and you're vesting or you're out of the company and you're not vesting. And those are your only two options. So there's not this fine grained, you know, stay with the company, but you're only working half time right. instead of full time. Like that just, you know, the vesting schedule doesn't cover that scenario. And that's actually a very likely scenario. Like it turns out someone's not contributing as much as they thought they would, but, but they're still a key player and right. they still want to be involved. And it still makes sense to the company for them to be involved. So what the Slicing Pie book does is get into Got that you. problem, um, which is really, you know, especially now that we're all distributed and you're not even necessarily sitting in the same office, people are contributing different amounts of hours. People have different skill sets. Um, they're giving up different amounts of hourly compensation. Right. You know, every hour I spend building a startup as a startup, I'm not getting paid a regular paycheck and I may bill out at either a super high rate or a super low rate compared to other members of the, sure. of the team. I may also be bringing cash to the deal. You know, one or more team members may be, may be paying the server costs or the computer costs or the marketing costs or the travel costs or whatever it is. Um, and there's all kinds of different, uh, sure. different inputs, right? So what Slicing Pi is trying to do is map that all out so that as you're going through that initial phase, you can have some sense of fairness. Um, and you set the rules in advance so everyone knows what the rules are. And as people uh, come into the team or as people maybe leave the team, you know, the rules are all set in advance. It's a much easier conversation because people people make decisions knowing what the ramifications are ahead of time yep. versus that horrible cleanup sure. process. That makes after a lot of that. sense. So do you recommend then that people almost meet monthly or qu quarterly to say, yeah, I earned my keep this month for lack of a better term? Or, or how do you kind of handle that? Because that's got to be a tricky conversation to have, right? Right. Um, and, and, you know, the first and public is short and, uh, okay. he gets into that. Um, but you can either keep hourly or daily or weekly gotcha. timesheets. You know, if someone's, if someone's really working full time, you can just, or beyond full time, you can just credit them right. a block of hours. Uh, I've been doing consulting for a lot of years. So, you know, I'm just in the habit of keeping timesheets. So I just track my stuff by hour by project right. anyway. Um, so that's usually what I do is I just, I, I know how many hours I work because right. I'm used to tracking it. Uh, again, it depends on the team and how fine green sure. you want to be. Uh, and I think each team is going to have its own cadence. Um, you know, I, I think the, the core thing to take away is not necessarily the specifics of the solution, but that you need to set the rules in gotcha. advance. So if it is a weekly meeting or a monthly meeting and everyone's submitting timesheets, that's the expectation in advance and people know to do that and they know that there's ramifications if they don't gotcha. do that. And equity is particularly, you know, it's a particularly touchy subject. It's hard to talk about. Um, and I think the nice thing about this is it gets all out into the, out, out sure. on the table, at least right, at the beginning. Right. 
Um, it still gets complicated later, uh, you know, and I've seen all kinds of backroom dealings and, you know, just, I've just sure, seen all I kinds of crazy stuff. So there's time for that, but this keeps right, it right, right. the Right, right, right. But I think that's also super important because you could even tie shares two hours in a month, right? And you say like, okay, well, if uh, for, this yeah. is obviously not how it would be, but you could say like for every 10 hours you, you work, you get like a percentage or something, right? And if you only work, you know, right. 20 hours instead of 40 hours that month, because that's the set amount that everybody can work that month, well, you only get, you know, 20% or, or 2%, sorry, instead of 4%. Like you can do all that stuff, right? And if everybody agrees to it and it's accountable, like – you can't really argue, right? If you don't put in your amount that month, yeah, that, right. that makes exactly. a lot of sense. That's interesting. And, and I think people kind of overvalue the idea. Um, the idea is great, and it may be a key insight, and it's you know it's probably worth something, but it's probably worth one yeah, percent, yeah, not ninety totally. percent. What's really valuable totally. is the execution. Uh, and so it's the hours that people are putting in uh, to make this stuff happen. And it may be, you know, sort of the, the smartness as well. Like you may have someone who doesn't put in as many hours, but man, sure. do they know what or they're doing. Or their network. Or... And so you value that person's input a little. Fair. Yeah, exactly. So you value that person's input a little bit higher because they're saving you time that you would otherwise right. have to brute force sure. or mess yeah, up. That makes sense. You know? And then, and then I think this sort of, uh, you know, rolling hourly, weekly, monthly recalibration makes it, you know, some people are really working all the time and maybe even putting money into the company. And, uh, you know, if you bring someone on later in the process who's not doing either of those things, you know, it, it barely allocates their risk versus the risk that, that, that initial right, person right. has taken. No, that's really good advice, actually. Or at least, or at least more fairly than other sure. systems I've seen. Nothing. Yeah. No. Fair, fair right? enough. And it's <laughs> it's tricky when you know you you know people or you're friends with them and you're you're trying to do something kind of on the side or thinking about maybe leaving your jobs or whatnot and you you lose friendships and whatnot over over some thing that you know. If you just would have kind of maybe figured it out at the beginning, the chances of, you know, that friendship still sticking together through it is probably a lot higher than if you just kind of shake on it, you know. That is a really important point, uh, and I have lost um, yeah, me at as least well. one friend. Uh, and we actually, you know, we went and had a, a couple of years after that, we went and sat down together in a coffee shop and at least talked through it and well, got rid good. of the hostility, but we still don't, but we still don't communicate, you know, and it's been, oh, wow. I don't know, 10 years now or five years, you know, and it's like, totally. that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, I agree. If the expectations have been set out in advance, at least then, you know, when I'm making a decision, I know the ramifications of my totally. decision in advance, and I can decide if that's a, a consequence I want to take versus finding out after the fact. You know, it's just it's just much easier to deal with if I know in advance what the rules are. No, I, I think that's that's really good advice, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, we're we're kind of coming to the end of um, part two. I'm wondering if we want to close the show with any other kind of advice or things that you see talking to startups that they're kind of maybe missing the boat on or, or not really understanding that you maybe want to kind of close the show with? Uh, I think um, one of those things I, I, that's sort of near and dear to my heart because I've always been uh, a sales guy and I've, you know, I've always been pretty sure. much in startup sales I think sales is really easy. It's not okay. it's not scary. You know, I think sales is just it's really just conversations and it's a lot of listening and it's really getting to know your customer and being able to help them. Um and I think sometimes people get 
really confused about that and they think scale, sales is a scary thing or the sleazy thing. And sort of what we've been talking about a lot here is going out and getting people to commit to give you money sure. in advance because you're really solving their yep. pain point before you even build anything. And that right there is the start of your sales efforts. And you can do that whether you're building a consumer-facing app or a sure. business-facing app. Um, and then you've, you've got that revenue stream. You understand how you're helping people. Your price is fair. And then you have the tools you need, if you really believe in yourself, to continue to have those conversations with right. more people. And, and those conversations take a couple forms. You know, there's old school selling where, you know, I call you on the phone or send you an email and go visit you and we have a meeting or I give you a, a demo over the web that, you know, we're talking in person. And then I think there's, you know, the internet has, has brought about the age of the landing page and the newsletter and the ads that follow you all over the internet. Um, which I think are all part of the same sure. conversation. That conversation is, you know, I can really help you solve this problem gotcha. for a fair price. And, and I don't think there needs to be anything scary or sleazy about it. It's just that, you know, that's the business model. And that's why you're in business, to help people and to uh, receive enough sure. money to keep the doors open in return. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think that, that's actually really good advice. And I think I would put myself in the the shoes of kind of thinking sales is kind of this scary thing, partly because I've always kind of been kind of in the trenches actually doing the actual work in, in a lot of cases. And I'm starting to kind right. of come out of my comfort zone and actually start doing it a lot more. And I think one of the main reasons I wanted to even do the radio show was to kind of get out of my comfort zone. Like I feared public speaking, right? And the doing this gets right, me out of right. that comfort zone. And even just um, when you and I met in Florida, um, just like that networking at the Startup Expo, I've never been to an event where you could network and everybody was there to just like network. And it was crazy good. Like I've never been to an yeah. event. And I've been to con like a bunch of conferences over the years. And just it was insane how many people were there to just like, obviously see the sessions, which were really good, but we're really there to network too, right? And I met a lot of really good people like yourself that I've had on the show and are still having on the show. Like I recorded a guy yesterday that I met in February, right? I just, that was just my backlog, right? And, you know, February to July, and I'm still recording people I met there. So it was so good for that. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think you made two important points there. One is, it, it's not scary. You just need to put yourself in a totally. situation where you get used to it. You know, and I, I suspect you're a lot better at those networking events having done the radio show for a while now because you realize... It's totally. Easy to and talk most people, to people are willing to talk, which is the other uh, thing that I never really realized. Like, it sounds yeah. really ridiculous. Yeah. Like, when I think about that, when I just say it to somebody, but most people want to talk to somebody, mm -hmm. especially at a networking event, right? <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do. Absolutely. Yes. And I, I think especially if you listen, um, and that's really the key to right. sales is listening. You know, it's maybe 25% talking, 75% listening, uh, and really bringing value, you know, which in your case, you know, you can talk about the radio show, you can, you've got stuff going on, you've learned totally. a lot from the radio show, so you've got something to say in those conversations. So, and, and again, if you're, if you're selling a product or a service, the value you're bringing is your knowledge of the industry and your knowledge of the customer and your knowledge of what the customer is going through and your guidance to help them solve whatever pain it is that they're, totally. that they're navigating. And, um, yes, I think you just, you know, I think what, what you've done is great. You put yourself in that situation and it really pays off, not just in business, but no. the rest of your life. It's just easier to talk to people. And no, the world totally. And people. I, I think that I think when you're creating content and that you're putting it either on different mediums, I think the fact that you're like a content creator, and I encourage everyone to be content creator. And it the the thing that scared me even when I started blogging years ago is 
I was like terrified to post something I wrote. And I, I look back now and I was like, okay, in a year, what, yeah. maybe 10 people would have read a post. Maybe. But like, <laughs> you know, like at the time, like my right. portfolio, which w would have been under years ago, wasn't getting tons of traffic, right? And and so, it, like, mm -hmm. I don't know why I was so scared. And, and like the fact that I'm over that now, I think hopefully somebody, you know, starts blogging because of somebody or that I have on the show or they start a company or, you know, reach out to somebody that they've been looking to reach out to for a number of years. Right. And you might not hear back, but you got to yep. keep at it. Right. It's not always this success story every time you do something. Right. Yeah, yeah, I fail at stuff every day. Some things I do work. Yeah, and exactly. I just keep doing like, more I'm in the same <laughs> boat. I'm like, oh, what happened today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Mike, but... Right, that's totally Yeah, but Mike, correct. sadly, we're, we're out of time. But I think let's maybe end the show with mentioning where people can find you online. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just at MikeLingle.com. It's M-I-K-E-L-I-N-G-L-E.com. Uh, you can find me on the web. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I would love to hear from you, and I'm happy to talk about startups, pitch decks, strategy, sales, uh, product development, anything anything people want to talk about. Awesome, man. Well, again, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to be on the show. You know, I look forward to staying in touch with you, and who knows, maybe we'll do another one in one of these days. That sounds great. I'd love talking to you, so uh, let sounds me know great, if you man. want to talk again. All right. Well, have a good rest of your day. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com. And keep them in the future.